The views expressed by guests on the Living Chronic Faith podcast are not necessarily the views of Living Chronic Faith or of the host. This podcast does not constitute or replace medical advice. Please consult with your physician before altering your health care plan. Hi, I'm Allie, and I'm Living Chronic Faith. Thanks for stopping by, and welcome to the podcast. The name says it all. I believe that our faith has to be as chronic as our symptoms, and this podcast is a safe space for us to explore meaningful ways to live our lives according to that faith. It's my prayer that after this episode, you will be more encouraged, more educated, and more equipped to live out your chronic faith. Hello and welcome once again. I am excited to bring to you our next guest on Living Chronic Faith Podcast. This is a dear friend of mine, a beautiful lady and a beautiful woman of God. Her name is Chantel Janice. And Chantel is a life coach, a Christian care coach, and she is also the founder of Purpose in the Pain, which is a ministry that serves women who are living with chronic conditions. And I'm so excited to introduce her to you. Chantel, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Absolutely. I'm excited too. Um, I'd like for you to just start out, if you would, by telling us a little bit about your chronic illness journey and Mm -hmm. also what brought you to the work that you're doing with purpose in the pain. For sure. So, you know, Allison, I really think that my chronic illness journey started when I was a teenager. I just didn't know, Mm -hmm. right? Like I was functioning in the, the, the pain. I thought it was normal. So I just normalized it, took the medicine that I needed to go on with my daily activities in school and things of that nature. Um, but it wasn't until 2016 when I started feeling this excruciating pain in a lower left abdomen, lower left side of my abdomen, it was different. And I was like, okay, what is this? Um, it took two years, few misdiagnoses, and um, you know, I, I went undiagnosed until I was finally diagnosed with endometriosis in 2018. So during this time, I was in the military. Um, they did offer me um, an option for like pain management, and I declined that. I did not want to take that medicine. And mm-hmm. so I, you know, had a, a medical discharge. Soon before I was actually discharged, I was then diagnosed with fibromyalgia. And then then about a year after that, I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome. Hmm. Yeah. So it's been quite the journey. Um, Just thinking back to like, you know, when that, because the the endometriosis is, you know, a pelvic chronic pain chronic pain disorder. And so I had to go back and I'm like, I had excruciating cramps when I was in high school but I didn't have anything to compare it to. I'm an only child. So I don't have any, you know, older sisters or anything like that. Mm. You normally associate cramps. Like how do you measure it? How do you know what's normal and what's not normal? Um, And so, yeah, that was the story. Um, I was medically discharged. I started working for the department of defense the same year, same month, same year that I was discharged. I thank God for, you know, keeping me through that. And so how I became, how I got, you know, this purpose in the pain ministry, very interesting. Um, (laughs) I thought that kids, like, I just knew that children was going to be my ministry. Um, Mm. I have a daughter, I love kids. And I was just like, you know what, that that's where my heart is. But you know, sometimes God has a different plan. Um, And so I got to a point in my life where I was actually thirsting for a purpose. It was about, Mm. I think it was in 2017, 2018 timeframe. I'm like, Lord, what is my purpose in life? And during this particular time, I was at a conference. I was at Megafest in Texas. And so I'm around all the vendors and, you know, the, the guest speakers and all these things are going on. And just all I see people just thriving in their purpose and I'm like Lord like what am I created to do like what this this can't be it like just that this lot of like chronic pain and chronic illness like that's just not it I know that you have more for me um and so I heard purpose in the pain while I was in that moment like crying out to him and so I wrote it down and started looking like for the URL, like all the things, right? Like started looking for the domain and to see if the name was taken on social media. Cause I didn't know, I know what I heard, but I did not know what, where we were going with it. Um, and so started out as a blog in 2018 and then we um, became a nonprofit organization in 2020. Wow. So many things that you said that I, I want to go back to. Um, first of all, talking about your 
diagnosis uh, journey. Um, I think that so many of us have symptoms that just like you said, we don't have anything else to compare it to. And mm -hmm. so it does become part of our normal. And when we sometimes realize that other people don't experience life that way, it's not until then that we realize maybe there's something different about what I'm feeling mm -hmm. and, and address that. Uh, but so many people uh, discount those symptoms. And I just want to um, emphasize that yeah. we shouldn't, if we're experiencing pain, pain is difficult, but it's mm -hmm. a gift. Mm -hmm. It is an alarm system in our body that is meant to tell us that something is off. Indeed. And we should be addressing those symptoms. And also you said something very relatable, which is that it was years before you received the diagnosis, yeah. that there were even some misdiagnoses along the way. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy to get discouraged in that process. Indeed. But what you did in, in sticking with it and going back another time and going back for the next test, it's a challenging process, but it's so rewarding once you get that diagnosis, and even though it's chronic, so there may not be an existing cure at this moment, there are treatments mm -hmm. and there are things that can help us get better. And yeah. even um, a lot of um, organic paths, natural paths, you know, yeah. that we can go just to address some of those issues. Um, and then you also mentioned having multiple diagnoses, which mm -hmm. you said endometriosis, fibromyalgia, and chronic fatigue syndrome. And I heard pain, pain, and more, and pain, more pain and a whole lot of tired. Mm -hmm. right? And it is a lot to um, augment those things that you're dealing with, with mm -hmm. other diagnoses. Um, and so it's just so encouraging. And thank you for sharing uh, that process. Um, it's so encouraging just to see someone that is still going, someone that has not let those things stop. Mm -hmm. And I want just to talk about that for a little bit, how mm -hmm. those conditions, those diagnoses have impacted your daily life. What's different? Mm -hmm. And how do you manage those things that are different? What are some of the adjustments that you've had to make? Yeah, for sure. So uh, they impacted me both mentally and, you know, physically, like those are, you know, physical um, chronic pain uh, disorders, but physical you know, intertwines with the, with the mental and emotional, eventually, right. Um, and so what I had to do practically is when I was first diagnosed, I'm a single mom and I was, it was just me and my daughter. So I had to lean on my parents a lot, um, for assistance and who that's such a blessing. So that's something that I had to do to like manage, but then also I had to learn how to cope, have hope mm. in this, you know, and, and implement things to live well. And what that was, what that looked like was being okay. And, and it was a process though. Right. But I had to get to the point of understanding that having living life now with limitations is not a weakness, like being cognizant Ooh. of those limitations. That is actually a strength yes. because that alleviates future pain that alleviates flare-ups, you know, that alleviates all, all the other things that will come. So I had to learn how to live with, um, being okay with living a life with limitations and knowing that, you know, that it's okay, but then also living okay. with boundaries, you know, in my life, um, placing boundaries around others' expectations of me because I have to live well. So I can't put too much on myself, you mm -hmm. know, because again, things like that exacerbates the pain and then we go into a flare up. So it's just learning to create healthy boundaries, how to um, be okay with limitations. And then also things like journaling, right? So blogging was um, therapeutic for me. Uh, journaling's mm -hmm. therapeutic. Going to school is therapeutic. Like I love, <laughs> I love learning and I love school. So I love school. So yeah, just those type of things. Wow. Living well, I think is such a, it's such an important uh, pursuit, but I also think that it's relative mm -hmm. um, and, and it's okay that living well for you looks different than what living well looks like for someone else. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that came to mind while you were speaking was that um, you're talking about being okay with the limitations and I never thought about it like this before, but I think that there may be people who, who carry guilt mm -hmm. um, for their diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. for anyone who might be, you know, listening to or watching this, 
that may need to hear it, it's not your fault. Mm -mm. It's not anything that you could have or should have done differently um, to avoid this circumstance. And like Chantel said, it's okay to be okay with where you are in this moment. Yeah. You know, there are some things that we can improve. There are some things that we can work on, but where you are right now, Mm -hmm. it's okay. It is okay. One of the things that um, was so pivotal for me in my journey was the idea of acceptance Mm -hmm. Um, and looking at the stages of grief, right? We we go through all of those stages, Um, but acceptance is the goal and acceptance doesn't mean, okay, well, I accept that this is, you know, this is what I am. This is all my life is ever going to be. That's not what is meant by acceptance. Mm -hmm. It's meant that we acknowledge the the science of it mm-hmm. and we allow that to be the catalyst for our strategy yeah. for how we go forward with what you call living well. Yeah. You know, if it was our vehicle, right? And we see the check engine light, there are those of us who ride with that check engine light for years. <laughs> mm-hmm. But once the car starts not functioning well, right? We've ignored the signal light for a long time, but once the function is impacted, then we will go to the service center and have it evaluated. Mm -hmm. And then if they say, oh, well, you need this, then we start going through those steps to get that taken care of. Yeah. Sometimes with ourselves, it's that same process, but somewhere along the line, we feel like we did something wrong when in reality, it's just normal wear and tear. Normal wear and tear. I love that analogy. You love know? that analogy because it's the it's the the mental part of it. You yes. know, it's 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 challenging. It's very mm-hmm. challenging. You know, you could start asking the questions like, "Why me?" You know, um, "Why am I in this circumstance? I didn't ask mm-hmm. for this. These lifestyle changes. It's very challenging to get through." But you know, we learn to live well, mm-hmm. and it is a process. It helps tremendously it does it it affects everything though right it affects our goals and our dreams it affects our our view of ourselves yes you know because there are things that change about what I'm used to doing that I can't do anymore and Mm -hmm. unfortunately as humans we are uh, conditioned to attach our identity to what we do indeed Mm mm-hmm and I have an aunt that always says, we're human beings, not human doings. Mm-hmm. I love and that. Yet we still, if we find ourselves unable to, uh, you know, complete an activity that we're used to doing, all of a sudden our identity is in question. Who am I now that I can't, you know, direct the choir? Who am I now that I can't drive trucks anymore? Who am I now? Yeah. And the reality is you're still the same incredible, unique fearfully and wonderfully made person that God made you to be from the beginning. Absolutely. And you are still his workmanship. Indeed. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone else and even ourselves, we might look at the condition of our bodies and say, okay, it's over. You know, there's nothing else that is valuable in me, but God still looks at us and says, very good. Very good. Yeah. And it's intentional. We're all part of his perfect design. Yes. He knew it all. Mm -hmm. I think that it's so important to realize that too, that he did know. He knew before we even were, you know, created, before we even came into the world, he knew the challenges that our bodies would would experience. And he still decided to make us. Indeed. He wanted us. And it's not that he made us to suffer. It's not that he made us to go through this. Yeah. But he knew that it would come and that he would allow it. Yeah but it's for our good and for his glory. And we don't always know what that means right uh, right in the moment. Mm -hmm. But I believe that if we hang on and if we continue to walk one step at a time, following him and pursuing his purpose for our lives, we will see what it is meant for us to see. And we will understand that he's working it all together for our good. Mm -hmm. It's an Mm -hmm. amazing journey. And I'm just so grateful, you know, just to hear the things that you're sharing about your particular journey. What was it like for you um, when you found that you were going to have to have this change in your career? 
Oh, so I went actually through two career changes. Okay. So um, initially, you know, I was in the military. I was what I would consider thriving. You know, I'm a young adult. I have a career now just doing well. Mm -hmm. And then this issue comes up and then it's like, well, we have to medically discharge you because, you know, you declined this particular treatment and I get it. Um, things happen. So that wasn't easy um, to cope with because again, being a single mother and that was what I deemed as my sufficiency or my, um, my provisions, if you will, mm -hmm. at that time, it was like, well, what's next? What am, what am I going to do? How am I going to survive? You know, where's my sustainability? Um, but again, by the grace of God, I had another job, you know, lined up before I was actually discharged, but even coming mm -hmm. out of that, like I chose to go into the military. I loved the military. I, mm -hmm. I truly enjoyed, you know, the camaraderie, just learning about, you know, my job. I was in human resources management. I, I just enjoyed the military. Um, so when I, when that had to happen, I was it was a question. It's like, like, mm -hmm. I didn't ask for this. You know, I was just coming out of two years of excruciating pain, not knowing what was going on with me. So then I'm already dealing with those, those mental um, challenges and all, all of that, trying to just figure it out and figure out life. And like, what is this? Like, I was literally at the point of giving up. Like I was tired of going to doctors. I went to all the doctors and um, I was in Maryland at the time. So went to all the doctors in the DMV area between um, uh, Maryland and Virginia and then DC and same response. We don't know what it is. We don't know what it is. Um, so I was at the point of giving up. And then, then once I found out, you know, that I was diagnosed and it's like, okay, we well, have to be discharged. I'm like, another, you know, another thing that I didn't ask for, another thing that just sprung up on me. Yeah. So like, how do I deal with this? Um, but one thing that helped me when I got to my job um, in uh, for the federal government is a reasonable accommodation. So mm -hmm. that That's helped good. me to be able to function and live well. Initially, I didn't even know it was a thing. My supervisor at the time was just gracious enough to allow me to telework, which that wow. telework is like, what is that back then? Right. It's like a super popular yes. now. back then. It wasn't um, as uh, popular, but she was just so gracious enough to allow me to do that. And then um, my spirit, was, I just wanted to protect the both of us. Cause you know, after a while people start asking questions like, well, why, why does she get to do that? And not me. Right. Um, and then that's when I found out about the reasonable accommodation. And that from that point, that was 2009. And then I was um, medically separated from the federal government in 2020. So from that time, I had a reasonable accommodation. And that really helped me to be able to function, to work, to uh, have that understanding with my coworkers, still for myself to be able to fulfill the mission and my job duties, but still be able to have that balance when needed. It helps. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's so good. And that's so important to have that in place. Um, for anyone who is not familiar with that terminology, can you talk just a little bit about what reasonable accommodation means? Oh, for sure. So it is a, a process. It's something in place for uh, people that may have a chronic illness or chronic pain that just needs assistance to be able to work, just have accommodations at their workplace, right? So that can be uh, teleworking for me. I was able to telework twice a week. Um, I was able to have a heater at my desk because temperatures, mm. certain temperatures bring on flare ups. Yes. Um, I was able to have rest, br rest breaks, um, I think 10 minutes an hour without being questioned about where my wow. whereabouts. Um, so it just really helped me to be able to live well, have a good balance, but then also get the work done and be covered, be covered while doing that. Be covered, by covered, I mean, have it on paper. Yes, that's the key. Yeah. And this is something that is so critical. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act covers this and actually mandates this. Mm -hmm. um, for, for businesses of a certain uh, description and size, but there are mandates in place where if you have the appropriate documentation on file, yeah. um, that there are these accommodations that are available. Um, and that can be anything like you said, if, if, in case you might need an extra bathroom break mm -hmm. or you know, just, just different things. If there are things where um, you have issues with reaching 
uh, to a certain height. This can, you know, provide an accommodation for that. The whole goal of that reasonable accommodation is to level the playing field. Yeah. So that you can continue to do the work that you're there to do without having the difficulty, without having the stress and the physical uh, impact that others would not have doing that job. So it's just to level the playing field. Mm -hmm. And um, it's applicable if you're in school, there's an accommodation. And there are even accommodations for entrepreneurs. Mm. Um, So it's important just to kind of look at that. Um, The uh, US Department of Labor has this information on their website. I encourage uh, anyone to go and look that look that up for your state, for your uh, situation, and for your condition, um, and just find out that information. It's so important because I think a lot of the discouragement that we have is that we can't do some of those things physically. But for some of us, there are things that we can't do the way that we once did them. Mm-hmm. But if we can adjust or adapt it, we can still get the work done. Absolutely. And we just need to be able to have that um, in place, that accommodation in place so that we can continue to do what we're there to do. That's such a great point. Absolutely. Um, that you know brings me to an, another question that I have um, because the world that we live in is not designed for mm-hmm. people with chronic diagnoses. And one of the big challenges that a lot of us face is in our relationships. Mm-hmm. You know, our bodies don't always cooperate with what we want to do with what we have scheduled and planned. And they sometimes tell us when we can go and when we can't. Yeah. And people can misinterpret that mm-hmm. and think, oh, well, they don't want to be bothered or they just don't want to come to this event. And it's not that at all. It's just that our bodies are, um, if you're familiar with spoons theory, our bodies were out of spoons for the day. Yeah. <laughs> um, or sometimes we have every intention of going to the wedding or the baby shower or the birthday party but we wake up that morning and our bodies are saying, you're not going not anywhere. Capacity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so what is your process? How have your relationships been affected? How have you uh, learned to communicate with, you know, loved ones, with friends, with coworkers? How have you learned to, you know, communicate what you're dealing with and how have your relationships been impacted? Mm-hmm. So um, it's so interesting you say that, right? Because the next 30 minutes, we don't know how we're going to feel. Right. So we can we can make all the plans, but we don't know how, you know, that's going to play out. Um, But my relationships have been well. So Mm -hmm. like I said, my parents, they've always been a good support system for me. So grateful for that. Um, My best friend, I've had the same best friend since uh, ninth grade orientation, the first day of my orientation. So that's she's a blessing. Been, it's a blessing. Yeah, she's been a blessing to me um, and my daughter. Um, so, you know, that's not, that hasn't changed. She shows compassion and empathy in all things. So I'm just so grateful for that. And God has truly blessed me with a group of sisters in Christ that understand. And they, they may not understand firsthand because they don't have, you know, the, the, the mm-hmm. chronic illnesses, but they respect me and they understand me and that helps tremendously because I in the past I've struggled with trying to make it knowing that I can't knowing that my body's saying this ain't it I don't Mm -hmm. you know we don't have the physical capacity today but I'm thinking about the person I'm thinking about the perception of having to cancel last minute and that hasn't been easy on me in the past it's easier now But in the past, it's something that I definitely struggled with. And I have lost, you know, friendship. Some things are intentional. Some, some things have to happen. So other things can happen. Um, You know, I've I've lost friendships, but I've also gained amazing um, sisters. And it's, it's, I wrote a blog on um, uh, the website years ago. And it was something about like when the RSV, when you RSVP and it goes from um, yes to no. And mm-hmm. that helped me in that moment because I was actually struggling with that myself. Mm-hmm. You know, I had committed to an event. It was someone's birthday party and I really wanted to go, Yeah, but I just couldn't, I didn't, I didn't have the capacity. So even sitting down and writing that blog was therapeutic for me and prayerfully was therapeutic for um, other people. But even in the goal, to going back to the workplace, I know you mentioned coworkers, just having that reasonable accommodation in place. And one thing mm-hmm. that helps helped me is when I realized that I was open and talking about my conditions because some people don't want to, you know, disclose that. Yes. For me, 
self-disclosing and having those conversations, I'm allowing people to support me. Mm. I'm allowing people in to know what's going on. So with my coworkers, I was very open with them um, about my conditions. And I've, I had really amazing colleagues that, you know, we, we, we worked well. There was no issues there. That is such a good point. And, and I think um, a lot of people and myself included um, are hesitant to disclose Mm-hmm. Um, for a number of reasons, for a number of very valid reasons. Oh, of course. Um, you know, we don't want to be pitied. We don't want to be uh, deemed less capable. Um, mm-hmm. And there are a lot of assumptions that go along with that. Um, and so it's completely understandable if people want to maintain their privacy. Absolutely. But there are also, like you said, advantages to having that understanding already in place where people already know what they should and should not expect. Mm-hmm. Um, and you will, you may find that your coworkers will be more supportive than you anticipated. Mm-hmm. Um, I know at, at my former job, um, I had so many people who came alongside and supported me and uh, were, you know, they understood the challenges I was up against some days. And so they would say, you know what, how about if you take on this task and we'll cover this task? And so there was still a a balance of duties and and responsibilities. It's just that they gave me an accommodation without it having to come from HR, if that Mm. makes sense. And I think that sometimes when you you cultivate those relationships, Mm -hmm. um, there is that understanding where people want to support. Yeah. Um, But again, there are certain circumstances where people don't, and that's where that reasonable accommodation comes in. Mm -hmm. Uh, because we are absolutely 100% entitled to whatever is covered under that ADA. Mm -hmm. For sure. And it's not a concession, if you will. We're not conceding that I can't. Mm -hmm. What we're saying is that when we do it this way, I can. It works. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with using assistive devices uh, and, you, you know, utilizing uh, the skycap service where you go to the airport, things yeah. of that nature. You can go and force yourself to walk through the airport with your carry on and mm-hmm. be absolutely exhausted by the time you get to the gate. Yeah. But you're going to spend the entire trip recovering in the hotel room versus allowing the skycap to do the job that they are there to do. Yeah. And having your energy when you get there so that you can enjoy the trip that you're going on. So good. So, there's always these trade-offs and, mm-hmm. and I'm going to be very honest. We can hold on to our pride mm-hmm. or we can hold on to our energy. We yeah. can, you know, be proud and, and, and have, and save face, if you will, or we can live well. Live well. Indeed. And I believe that that's what God wants for us is for us to live well. Indeed. Um, and what, what role has, and you've kind of alluded to it already, but what role has your faith played in this process? <laughs> I know that face will. <laughs> I can't even imagine <clears throat> um, life without Christ. Mm. I can't imagine this life without my faith, right? Um, I know as, as, as pe- people generally, we, mm. we try to do things just on our own, right? Like, I I know how to do this. I'm just going to figure this out. Um, I also struggle with, struggled with emotional chronic pain in a past Mm. toxic relationship. And I was like, I was at my wit's end, Allison. And so a friend of mine said, um, and I just, I praise God for vessels. She said, you need to go to church. That's all she said. You Mm. you need to go to church. And I was like, oh, okay. And so another friend (laughs) um <laughs> at the time like I didn't have a church home mm-hmm. so um I think I was still in the military at the time and on the base they had a church I would go you know periodically but it, I didn't I wasn't rooted I didn't have a personal relationship and so another friend of mine invited me to my now home church and I just praise God for the vessels because they're unrelated friends so it's just like God just like set that up he knew what I needed so I went through the journey of healing. I went through a few discipleships um, and I just, I can't imagine yeah. if like how I would have made it through 
that uh, emotional trauma and pain, then coping with this, these physical conditions Mm -hmm. in life. Like, I don't even want to, I'm exhausted just thinking like, how would that be? Yes. Just come. It's really impacted my life. Just knowing that I have a father that loves me so much that loves me so much that goes before me, right? In yes. all things, in all things, we can take, we can cast our cares upon him because he loves mm-hmm. us that much. We don't have to worry. We don't have to be anxious. He gives us rest as a gift. Like, Thank you. I, I'm just, I don't, I don't, I can't even put it into words. It's just how it would be without him, but I know with him, all is well, mm-hmm. all is well even in the midst of the pain even in the midst of you know a flare-up all is well that's such a powerful statement all is well and I think that there is a misinterpretation for people who don't experience life the way that we do um that we're putting that on, right? That we're just saying that to make ourselves feel better or that we're saying that to sound good. But there is a place in God Mm -hmm. that when we fully embrace who he is and who he wants to be in our lives, that all is well, even when everything isn't good, Mm -hmm. all is still well. All is still well. I love that so, so much. And as you reflect on, you know, that faith journey, it reminded me of when I was uh, first diagnosed and my doctor offered to prescribe an antidepressant mm. because depression is such a normal thing to come along. And it's a normal byproduct of yeah. a chronic diagnosis mm-hmm. because literally what they're saying is every single day for the rest of your life, you're going to have some symptoms. Mm-hmm. You're going to be experiencing um, challenges physically that that other people may not be experiencing mm-hmm. and when you're facing that um, and you know that you're going to wake up every single day in pain that there's never going to be a day where you're not facing the challenges that's heavy it really is and mm-hmm. it's a lot to process that you're going to completely have to reinvent yourself because everything that you once knew you know the way that you look is going to change the way that you interact with people is going to change the way that you you know socialize is going to change that can be very very uh very very difficult for people Mm -hmm. um so my encouragement uh for people who are going through that process lean into um the help take the help um i will say this antidepressants are not forever (laughs) they don't have to be Mm -hmm. um so if that is where you are if you're in that place and your doctor recommends that and you have prayerfully considered it and you feel that's where God is leading you there's no shame right um I am an advocate for counseling Mm -hmm. coaching therapy whatever it is that is going to help you find the support that you need Mm -hmm. Um, There are support groups, there are ministries like Purpose in the Pain, like Living Chronic Faith that you can lean into for support and for resources and for um, just someone that understands Mm -hmm. when you say, I woke up this morning and the bed wouldn't let me go. And there are going to be a group of people to say, I know what you mean. I had that last week. You know, it's so empowering to -hmm. realize that even though everything that you're dealing with, we all have a uniqueness to the way that we experience our symptoms, but there are people who go through life in a similar way mm-hmm. and can relate to what you're dealing with. It makes you feel so much less alone. Exactly. And I believe the enemy would love to isolate us and make us feel like we're the Absolutely. only ones going through it. Absolutely. And for that reason, there's something wrong with us. And the truth of the matter is that there's nothing wrong with us in terms of who we are as people. Mm-hmm. We are still the incredibly meticulously divinely created creation of God yeah and there's nothing that takes away our identity as his kids yes and can I add something to that as well um going back to the question that you asked about faith um, as I was just listening to you talk what dropped in my spirit is 
even like, so when I first was diagnosed with my chronic pain, I knew mm-hmm. God, like I said, I didn't have a, a rooted personal relationship, mm-hmm. but you know, the word tells us that, you know, when we accept Christ, we, we become a new creation. Yes. And when we go through these chronic pain um, disorders or when we're diagnosed, you mentioned this earlier, and I just heard you say identity, we tend to take on a, a, a new identity as we're grieving the old and we're coming into this new, like mm-hmm. this, this new um, version of me. But just remember that, you know, when we go into Christ, like for me, it was a different transition because I didn't, you know, I didn't have a personal relationship with him before that, yeah. but he replaced that identity, all those thoughts of inadequacy that, that I took on and, uh-huh. and the lack of self-value and, um, you know, not knowing who I am, like all of that was replaced. I found my true identity in him when, when, when I took on this personal relationship. Wow. That's so good. Mm-hmm. That is so good. I love that. Mm. That blessed me. <laughs> Um, you know, in this moment, I just, I really feel led to take a minute to pray uh, for anyone who is going through, you know, the, that phase that we're talking about, that yeah. depression and that identity loss and all of that, and that they would just lean into uh, this free relationship that God is offering them. Yeah. So let's just pray real quickly for anyone who's experiencing that. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness and thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you continue to call us into relationship with you, Lord, and that that relationship with you changes absolutely everything. God, I pray for anyone who is dealing with uh, any kind of situation. Uh, We're speaking particularly about chronic illness, but anyone that's going through anything that is taking them through a road of depression. God, I pray that you would just address that even right now in the name of Jesus. God, that you would speak peace to their emotions, Lord, that you would remind them of who they are in you. And Lord, if there is anyone that does not know you for themselves, that does not know you in the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your suffering, God, that they do not have personal relationship with you. God, I pray that you would just cause them to understand that you are for them, that you are with them, Lord God, and that you are calling them into this relationship. Lord, I pray that you would reveal by your spirit who you are and who you want to be to them. Lord, that they will desire to come to know you, that they will read their Bible, that they will pray, that they will seek out a church that believes your word and that preaches your word, and that will disciple and encourage and support them to grow in their relationship with you, Lord, that you would revolutionize and transform their lives for their good and for your glory. So God, I pray that you would just have your way in the minds, the hearts, the spirits, and the bodies of your people. Lord, that you will call them to your side and that they will be forever changed by your love and by your spirit. We Mm. thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus' name. Mm. Amen. So with that, I just want to ask you, because we talk a lot about leaning into the word, knowing what God says about us. Mm -hmm. What is a Bible verse that encourages you no matter what's going on? Mm. So I'd say like my foundational, my favorite is uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Okay. Yes. Trust me. Yes. Mm-hmm. That, is my, that is my all-time foundational. But when it comes, when I need to like overcome some challenges with chronic pain, yes, um, I believe it's 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That is it. Mm-hmm. And so that talks about the sufficient grace the sufficient, of God. Yes. I can read it. Um, mm-hmm. Would you like me to read it? Yes, please. Okay. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties for when I am weak, then I am strong. And that scripture just reminds me of Christ's love, his power and his sufficiency in all circumstances. So mm-hmm. even when I feel weak, when I feel down, when I feel like I just can't, that's just telling me that I can lean on to uh, Christ for his um, sufficiency because he's made perfect in my weakness and in his power. Wow. That's so good. As you were saying that, I I, I hear in pictures. So when you're talking, I'm mm-hmm. seeing visual. Mm-hmm. And what I could imagine is uh, a parent 
helping a child with something and specifically what I saw was cooking mm. um, I can remember even as a kid you know I wanted to help stir whatever was being prepared and sometimes when that batter gets really thick it's hard for a kid to stir because they don't have that strength in their arms and so what does the parent do they don't take it away from them they come behind them and they help them stir they add the strength that they need to get the job done mm. and I feel like with us when we lean into the sufficient grace of God yeah that we give him space and we give him permission to come in and add the strength that we don't have yeah. he doesn't take it away from us but he adds what we're lacking mm-hmm. and I'm just so grateful for that because his grace is so so overarching and so all-encompassing that it yeah. can be just in any situation that we find ourselves in and yeah. Paul is saying even insults and hardships and no matter what it is that we go through, that grace can still be applied. Still sustains us, still sustains us in all situations. Something, um, one thing that I say a lot is, um, and it just made me think about this scripture too, mm-hmm. is we do our best and God does the rest. Yes. That's it. That is so good. Mm-hmm. And that's really all that's required. And I think that this, that striving and that toiling comes from that sense of I have to get it done I have to do it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it was never meant to be that way it was never meant to be that way Hmm. and that's going back to the first verse the first passage that you mentioned Proverbs 3 5 and 6 trust in the Lord Mm -hmm. with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding and lean not to Instagram and lean not to the way that everybody else does it. Uh, Comparison is such a difficult thing for us, even among people with chronic illnesses. Mm -hmm. We feel like, okay, why is this person? We were, um, Chantel was one of our um, speakers and facilitators for the conference in December. And there was another young lady who um, is diagnosed with MS Mm. who runs marathons for fun Mm -hmm. bless her heart that's not my ministry but that's Mm -hmm. what God gave her yeah and so if I sit in this moment and say well I'm failing Mm -hmm. because I'm not running marathons like Janice Mm -hmm. then I'm going to miss out on the thing that's in my hands to do the thing that God gave me that nobody else has Mm -hmm. that's going to be missing from the world if I don't give it right and so we have to remember that I am not created to be like someone else. Mm-hmm. We're all different because God gave us that we're his workmanship. We're genuine, one of a kind. Mm-hmm. And so we cannot expect our lives or our bodies or anything else to function like someone else's. Yeah. But we have to dig in even the more to what is God's will for my life. Mm. So good. So wow, good. it's very, very empowering. Well, I just want to thank you for sharing so generously of yourself, of your story, of your experience, and and this encouragement, you know, to keep going, to not give up when you're going through the diagnosis journey, to not give up when you're going through the adjustment phase, Mm -hmm. to not give up when you have difficult days. Um, I think it's so powerful to take that away from Mm -hmm. today, you know, from our conversation. Um, Before we go, what words of encouragement would you give to others who are trying to balance, you know, everyday life in this chronic diagnosis they may be given? Yeah, um, I would just say, in addition to what you just said, is um, just imperative to know that you are not alone. Mm. You are not alone on a journey. I heard you say earlier that, you know, you're a proponent for counseling, for coaching, you know, whatever it is, a community, right? Our ministries, just knowing that you are not alone, um, knowing who who you are and what you were created to, like you were created on purpose for a purpose. Yes. This circumstance or the circumstances that you've gone through, you're going through right now does not diminish God's purpose for your life, does not diminish Mm -hmm. the reason why you were created. So don't discount any of it because God can use your story for his glory. Yeah. So just stay, stay encouraged and be blessed. Amen. Uh, Tell us, would you, uh, your website and your Instagram for purpose in the pain? Absolutely. So the website is www.purposeinthepain.com. Okay. And the Instagram handle is purpose in the pain. I told you it was all available when God gave it to me. I said, (laughs) listen, I'm grabbing it. That's how he'll work it out. Mm -hmm. That's how he'll do it. Awesome. Mm -hmm. 
Chantel, thank you so much for spending time with us and for sharing your story and sharing so much encouragement. I pray that it will bless the people and I look forward to our next conversation. You're welcome back anytime. Indeed, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. God bless you. Same. Hey, thanks so much for listening. If you want to stay up to date on what's happening in the LCF community or for more Faith First chronic diagnosis content, please visit our website at livingchronicfaith.com. And while you're there, consider registering for membership free of charge. Also, check us out on Instagram and YouTube at Living Chronic Faith. Be sure to follow and subscribe. Remember that I'm praying for you. Yes, you. And until next time, always expect great things. Talk to you soon.